welcome to our second inter imperialist mode of living conference. My name is Jos Geerts and I represent the board of SOC 21. This conference is a sequel of our conference last year in which we tried to grasp the notions of the phrase inter imperialist mode of living. This year, we dig deeper in the historicity of the issue. We are happy and proud that again, we have a team of excellent researchers as speakers and commentators, and again, a great number of attendees. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, not many of us meet here in person in sunny Amsterdam, although the streets are full of tourists. As a famous soccer player, Johan Cruyff, known for his typical language and expression set, Every disadvantage has its advantage. Hence, we welcome many attendees from very far away who without the digital revolution would not be able to join us. This year, the conference is organized by two organizations, a mouse and an elephant. We, the Dutch SOC 21, the Socialist Research Collective, is still a small bunch of Dutch activists. Uh, and our collaborator is the German-based Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, by all means the most important social research endeavor in Europe. It goes without saying that the fostering socialist research in order to define socialist politics for the 21st century demands a practical internationalization of the deed to paraphrase a famous anarchist topos. We thank the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for the trust in our initiative and hope for a fertile ma marriage. We are also happy to acknowledge what? Okay, yes, my face is not nice. Yeah, okay. No, no. You should you should be in full view with your head at the top of the. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm. So beautiful. Uh, we also happy to acknowledge the support of the Dutch Foundation for the Research in and Education on Scientific Socialism, SOVS, which works closely with the International Institute of Research and Education, IRE, founded by Ernest Mandel, in which building we now convene. The program is composed of the program committee uh, is composed of Marcel van der Linden, Uli Brandt, and Marcus Wiesen. During the conference, Marcel and I will co-chair the meeting. Then some practical issues. People in the room have been properly vaccinated, but nevertheless will keep distance. The Zoom session knows two categories of participants. One, the panelists who can speak and listen if they are not unmuted and two, the attendees who, due to technical reasons, can only listen. However, technology is here to help us again. So on our Zoom screen, you see a question and answering button. If you press this sign, you can type a comment or a question, as well as reading other people's comments. Herman Peterson, member of the SOC 21 board, is reading all Q and A's and will diligently keep track of them and will read them aloud during the discussion sessions. Note that you can vote in the Q and A panel with a thumb up. Hence, some majority democracy is guaranteed in case too many contributions are filed. Please do not use the chat box. This will hamper the Zoom session and we don't read it either. Further, we thank our Chief Technology Officer, Jeremy Crawlsmith, who is invisible for us, handling the technique and the recording of the sessions, which will be mounted on the website as was done in the last meeting. In the room, you also see Yes Wedemeyer, who takes care of drinks and lunch tomorrow for people in the room. He is also the person who can help you with problems. Please take your choice of drinks at any moment you fancy. This is for the people, of course, in the room, uh, other people at home can do it, of course, but by themselves. Furthermore, I urge you to use ear wear, as a typical problem of online meeting is the noise amplifying between microphones and loudspeakers. This also pertains to all speakers. We will now start the first session with the first speaker. 
Marcel van der Linde, a comrade in arms with who I once co-edited the magazine Klassenstrijd, Class Struggle, after which he dived deep in issues such as what is a worker, what is subaltern labor, and who belongs to the work class proper. Marcel is a labor historian and emeritus professor at the University of Amsterdam and was research director of the International Institute of Social History. Marcel introduced the theme of the conference and confront us with we us with we what we don't sorry. I will confront us with what we don't grasp yet and have to work on in this conference and beyond. I now give the floor to Marcel to enlighten us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, the global economy is uh, increasingly, as we know, reliant on collaboration among workers who do not know each other and who are not even aware of each other's existence. Uh, very occasionally, we are given a glimpse of that interconnectedness, as in 2013, when the collapse of Grana Plaza in Bangladesh gave us a chilling reminder that much clothing for rich countries is produced in appalling conditions by women and children and men, of course, in poor countries. Until recently, we did not dwell on such global connections, but more and more historians and social scientists nowadays want to understand them. His interest in what is also called teleconnections signals a new type of historiography, one which overtakes old style labor history from North America and Europe by incorporating its findings in a new globally orientated approach. My contribution now takes a perspective from below, emphasizing the global interactions of the laboring classes. The central question I would like to discuss is whether, and if so, to what extent, wage earners, and I understand wage earners here in a very broad sense, in the advanced capitalist countries, also referred to as the North, benefit from unequal ecological exchange and exploitative living and working conditions of producers and service providers in the poorer parts of the world. Here also referred to as the South. In other words, it is about relational inequality. Are wage earners in the North partly better off because Often others in the South are socioeconomically and ecologically worse off. And it is therefore about the ecological footprint also, that is the impact of human activities measured in terms of the area of biologically uh, productive land and water required to produce the goods consumed and to assimilate the wastes generated of the Northern working classes in the South and about the South-North value transfer. How important have these mechanisms of unequal exchange been in history and under which conditions did they occur? As a first orientation, I uh, suggest to roughly distinguish four periods. First, what I call the mercantilist period until about the 1930s. Then this first international division of labor from the 1830s to the 1940s. Then thirdly, the period of Fordism with the second international division of labor from the 1940s. And finally, the period of post-Fordism beginning in the 1970s. Let me begin with the mercantilist period. During the 17th and 18th centuries, the global flow of commodities uh, had been mainly unidirectional. The North acquired commodities produced in the South largely through pillaging and exploitation. Forced laborers mined gold and silver in Mexico and Bolivia, and enslaved workers cultivated sugarcane and coffee in Brazil, the Caribbean, and the US South. Trade in minerals and cash crops was still modest. It was, as Arthur Lewis, the famous economist, said, uh, a small uh, trade consisted of sugar, a few spices, precious metals, and luxury goods, and had caused much bloodshed, but it simply did not amount to very much. To the first southern goods that were consumed by workers in the north belonged tea, sugar, coffee, and tobacco, and somewhat later, cotton. This helps to explain, for instance, why the English working class families, even when real wages or nominal wages did not increase, could afford a growing quantity of colonial goods. Tea became a popular drink already in the early 18th century. Here you see the tea frenzy. Monocultures for sugar and cotton began to develop in the Caribbean, 
the US South and Brazil, while a large scale coffee cultivation began in Ceylon. The establishment of sugar plantations in the Americas relied on the labor of slaves imported from Africa. This development had several consequences. First, it led to a relative depopulation in the sending countries. Second, it stimulated European industries that provided goods required for the slave trade, such as commodities that could be used in exchange trade on the West African coast. Third, it stimulated the production of textiles, especially linen as cloth for uh, slaves. And this is a, we have recently only discussed this and discovered this is a, was a major uh, branch in Eastern Europe, in Silesia. And so uh, where lots of uh, domestic workers produced these linens for the slaves. And fourth, uh, the slave ships brought the West African mosquito Aedes aegypti to which most Africans were immune with catastrophic consequences for non-Africans. You see today's distribution here of uh, the yellow fever caused by this uh, mosquito. And you see nicely uh, how it is origin, area of or origin is in Africa, but how it also spread to uh, a large part of uh, South America. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I see that you, you do not see the PowerPoint that I prepared, the beautiful PowerPoint. So what can we do about that? Share screen. Share screen. Share screen. Go to Zoom. Yeah. Zoom. Zoom. In Zoom. Share ah. screen. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. And then we can see it on full screen. Yeah. There we are. Ah, now you see. Okay, let, let me quickly go back with the pictures, otherwise... Uh, I, uh, uh, sorry. So, uh, so, full screen for your PowerPoint. Full screen. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. yeah, to hang it. Ah, can you see it now? Okay, yes. Yes. Okay, so here we have the uh, catastrophe Rana Plaza in uh, Bangladesh. Here we have exploitation. You see on the one hand, on the left hand, you see silver mining in Potosi. And uh, the larger picture this uh, shows uh, slaves producing sugarcane in the Barbados. Here you see the tea frenzy. Uh, in the 18th century in England, everybody wants tea, as you can see. Here you see the, this, the geographical distribution of uh, yellow fever uh, and the nasty mosquito who caused it uh, on the screen. Now, um, let's see. Then we come to the first international division of labor uh, in the period 1830s, 1940s. In the 19th century, the first international division of labor followed on this mercantilist period. The growth of metropolitan capitalism increased the need to sell European goods in the colonies. North-South exchange came about. The South continued to supply commodities, tropical and subtropical cash crops especially, but the North now provided manufactured goods for the South. The first global division of labor thus led to a tendential deindustrialization of parts of the global South. You see here, uh, no, sorry, that's so. From around 1750 to 1950, capitalist industrialization was largely limited to the North Atlantic region, although, of course, industrial pockets existed in Brazil, India, and elsewhere. This international division of labor may uh, be characterized as semi capitalist since most of the commodities imported uh, in the, into the capitalist countries were still produced in a non or half capitalist uh, manner. But from the 1870s on, an ex expanding crop sequence developed. That will, that's to say the volume and the relative importance of imports increased, more crop types were imported, and the average distance over which imports were moved grew, enormously grew. Behind this spatial expansion lay also ecological considerations. Uh, Alf Harnborg, a Swedish uh, 
historian and ecologist, has, for example, revealed how advantageous for British entrepreneurs the replacement of homegrown wool by cotton growing in the US South has been around 1850. He calculated that 1.1 million hectares of cotton fields in North America generated the same revenue as the over 6 million hectares in Britain did for woolen manufacturers. This development culminated in what we call the first stage of globalization. Not only did the size and geographic spread of international trade increase sharply, but also the standard of living of workers and the profitability of industry in European nations came to depend on maintenance of overseas supplies, while the standard of living of the producers of raw materials came to depend on market fluctuations occurring sometimes on the other side of the world. During the interwar years, 1920s, 30s, uh, the global growth slowed, world trade declined, and autarkic tendencies arose in the global south. And also we saw the establishment of the Soviet Union, which initiated systemic competition. The situation of women in the South in particular deteriorated as a result of the first globalization. An example is Java, where from 1830, the cultivation system, Kulturstelsel, was in force, which obliged the rural population to devote part of its time to the production of cash crops, for which they received compensation from the colonial authorities below the market value. A Dutch historian, Elise van Nederheen Meerkerk, has calculated that by this policy, the labor time of women increased by 47%. At the same time, the East Indian gains enabled the Dutch government to lower the tax pressure in the Netherlands, while real wages in the metropole increased, allowing a male breadwinner model and a decreasing female labor force. Colonial profits, therefore, contributed to changing divisions of labor at the household level. In the South, agriculture shifted increasingly from subsistence to commodity production. Where colonialism could strengthen its hold on local populations, the situation of these populations deteriorated. There's a very interesting Indian economist, Utsa Patnaik, who has argued that there is an inverse relationship between primary products and domestic food grains. The reason is simple, she says. There's a limited supply of tropical lands, and if heavy external demands are made on its productive capacity, while insufficient investment is put in, then, she says, history demonstrates that the satisfaction of domestic needs is not possible, and local populations are plunged into undernutrition and poverty. So while we have increasing hunger in the South, the other side of the coin was the development of effective demand in the metropoles. During the 19th century, subtropical consumer goods more and more changed from luxury commodities to commodities consumed by working class families as well. The underlying reason for this shift probably were the increasing wages. The more technologically advanced the metropolitan production of consumer goods became, the cheaper these consumer goods and the higher the level of real wages. Obviously, the trend towards more wage earners consumption of goods produced in the South was uneven and depended on many different aspects like prosperity, taste, custom and gender. England was early on a major tea consumer but did not drink much coffee. Other countries, for instance, the Scandinavian countries, uh, were much more coffee consuming. Consumption of southern goods was further stimulated by the introduction of steamships and refrigeration techniques. Since the 1880s, these allowed perishable fruits to make long journeys. The consumption of bananas, for example, increased enormously. Here you see a number of ladies enjoying a banana. But despite all these developments, the share of southern goods in northern wage earners consumption seems to have remained quite modest during this first international division of labor. The slowly growing consumption of subtropical, good, subtropical goods in the north, including cotton, which is very became very important, of course, also by wage earners, and increasing exploitation of workers and peasants in the south, had a very positive effect on the economies of colonial powers. Their net surplus increased everywhere. Simultaneously, the ecological effects of the changing northern consumption patterns became visible. A few examples have to suffice. Take the Caribbean sugar plantations, which led to massive deforestation. Land had to be cleared, the furnaces and boilers needed fuel, and so on. 
Another example is the growing of pepper in the Netherlands Indies, in Aceh, in Sumatra, and Western Java during the early 20th century. Annual output required 57,000 hectares of land, but because of pepper's exhausting nature, regular and widespread rotations were practiced and more like almost half a million hectares was cleared, which rarely reverted to forest, but usually became grassland and so on. We can multiply the examples uh, ad infinitum. Imperialism not only resulted in cheap consumer goods, it also created jobs in the metropoles, for instance, in the textile industry and in the transport sector. There was a very interesting Congress of the Dutch Social Democratic Party in 1830. It was called the Colonial Congress. And there it was a, presented a calculation by uh, the Dutch economist Jan Tinberg, and later received the Nobel Prize, uh, for economics, uh, that immediate severance of the colonial ties would mean a loss of employment for 150,000 Dutch workers. That is about 10% of the total number. Now, we get to the next phase, and that is Fordism, 1940s, 1970s. From 1940, the colonial empires collapsed. The independence of Zimbabwe in 1980 was the final piece, but by 1975, the process was already largely completed. Fears of the European empires that the loss of colonies would bring about economic disaster proved unfounded. Martial aid and extensive armaments expenditure made it possible to absorb the blow. From the early 1950s, a new extended and turbulent period of economic growth commenced. In the advanced capitalist countries, the growing prosperity facilitated an often cumulative but planless process of reforms and changes resulting in a relatively wide spreading of the so-called standard employment relationship. These reforms pertain to a wide range of policy areas, including safety rules at work, legislation of workers' coalitions, regulation of labor time through shortening of the working day, shortening of the working week, and introduction of paid holidays, introduction of obligatory insurances, and of course, the arrival of full employment and a high wage economy. These developments were accompanied by significant changes within Northern families. Male breadwinning, which as we have seen, had its roots in the 19th century, as the example from Java showed, spread, although it did not become common anywhere. A new needs structure developed, eating customs, leisure habits, entertainment needs changed, and an independent youth culture emerged. Tourism increased, and employees were increasingly motorized, a trend that had already started before the Second World War in the United States and continued uh, with much power after 1945 in other advanced capitalist countries. And these changes were often accompanied by changing male-female relations. At the same time, the demand for raw materials grew dramatically, also for non-traditional ones, such as natural rubber, for car tires, uh, from subtropical regions, copper for wires from Chile, or germanium for transistors from China and Inner Mongolia. Meanwhile, the economic gap between rich and poor countries widened so that the prices of many complex consumer goods in the North could be kept relatively low. However, the period of tempestuous growth came, as we know, to an end around 1970. The average profit rate began to decline again, and economic growth also went down. This brings us to the last pay, uh, phase that I would like to distinguish post-Fordism since the 1970s. The relocation of industries, in, for instance, in textiles or in shipbuilding to low wage countries gave rise to the second division of labor. Industrialization now really got underway in the South and no longer focused mainly on the domestic market. As late as 1960, there was virtually no third world production of manufactured goods for export. By the late 1970s, however, there, there were many hundreds of thousands of workers in multinational corporate plants producing for exports from scores of sites in more than 60 countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Due in part to this shift, industrial jobs dropped sharply in the North, although there was little or no decline in industrial output there. Naturally, this had a positive effect on the income level of the Southern workers involved. At the same time, there was a clearly negative effect on the wages of some Northern working class groups. However, this effect was probably offset by the fall in prices of commodities produced in the South, which increased the purchasing power of the working class in the North. The average rate of profit gradually fell again and economic growth slowed. 
This brought about an ideological shift from an expansionist demand-driven policy to an anti-working class supply-oriented policy with a contradicting demand policy. As a result, the wage share, that is the share of wages in overall income has fallen in many countries at different speeds from the 1960s. Here, see, it's going down. It's not only in the rich countries, also in the southern countries that, that we see this declining wage share. While industrial employment decreased, the service and financial sectors expanded. The growing informal economy complicated things further since workers were provided with short-term contracts and tended to change jobs frequently to earn their income under often very precarious conditions. And often this shift implied the feminization of the employees. The new international division of labor resulted in an accelerating second globalization. As a consequence, the world's working class has been growing and changing rapidly. The International Labour Organization, ILO, estimates that between 1991 and 2020, the proportion of the world labour force in paid employment increased from about 44 to about 53%. So more than half of all the labour force in the world is now wage earner. Ever greater numbers of workers worldwide maintain direct economic contacts with each other, Transnationalization of labor processes, which started gradually in the 1960s and accelerated since the 1980s, has been crucial in this process. As a result, goods manufactured in one country are increasingly assembled from components produced in other countries, which in turn contain subcomponents made in still other countries. In the midst, uh, this process accelerated the consumption of fossil fuels, of course, both in the north and in the south, for transport, power generation, and so on. In the midst of this development, another kind of radical change took place. Socialism, so-called socialism, in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe collapsed. China and Vietnam, as we know, converted to capitalism, and India adapted to liberal market thinking. As a result, relatively well-earning segments of the wage-earning classes that are usually included in this vague category, category of the middle classes now also emerged in East and South Asia, uh, outside the old core countries of capitalism. In parallel, an important new development took place, the increasing export of hazardous production and hazardous waste from north to south. Exported wastes include substances that are costly to dispose of, such as PCBs, acids, sludge, used car batteries, paint solvents, plastics, heavy metals, so like lead and mercury, dioxine contaminated incinerator ash and radioactive waste. Very important changes also took place in agriculture. Production per hectare of most crops rose gradually at first and then explosively after the Second World War. An important driver of this growth is known as the Green Revolution, which changed much of agriculture in the Global South from the 1960s by introducing, introducing new varieties, irrigation, pesticides, and fertilizers. This campaign, the Green Revolution, was mainly supported by US institutions and served explicitly to avert a red revolution and the white revolution. The white revolution was what the Shah did in Iran and they don't want that, they didn't want the red revolution, so they have a green revolution. During the green revolution, international agencies and national governments propagated what was known as technification, nowadays also called modernization, which consisted of replacing traditional varieties of crops with varieties capable of growing without shade, enabling the density of plants to be increased. Here you see a nice example from Minas Gerais coffee in Brazil. As you can see, the new style coffee farms, for example, look industrial with long rows of coffee plants in the sun, regularly sprayed with fertilizers and chemical pesticides. While coffee output has clearly increased, farmers have become more dependent than in the past on a single source of income. The ecosystem has deteriorated and biodiversity has been reduced. Within this context, context of global connectedness, the part of Southern goods in the consumption pattern of Northern workers is likely to have grown significantly. Let me give, the, give, give me quickly two examples. First, mass motorization. Between 1960 and 2015, so that is in uh, 55 years, the number of registered cars increased worldwide from 98 million to 924 million. 
<clears throat> the uh, enormous diffusion of cars implied, amongst other things, significant growth of rubber consumption, in particular for the tires. And on this, on my PowerPoint, I had a picture of rubber tapping, but unfortunately that has disappeared. I don't know why. Uh, and that's especially, of course, with the tires, as I already said, and obviously the mass diffusion of cars implied an enormous increase in the demand for oil. The polluting implications of this trend are well known. My second example concerns a very recent innovation, the cell phone, uh, which uh, has an, had a diffusion which is nothing less than explosive. The number of cellular subscribers has grown from 23,000 in 1980 to 2.2 billion in 2005. And I don't know the figures for later years, but must have multi multiplied again. The rare metals used to build cell phones are frequently mined under horrendous circumstances. Cobalt and coltan, for instance, are often produced in sub-Saharan Africa by children or by violently oppressed workers. In this period, we see the arrival also of what has been called the Netherlands fallacy. And it's not because I'm Dutch that I'm mentioning this, it's because this is a, a uh, quite common notion amongst ecological economists. Netherlands fallacy means that advanced capitalist countries possess the economic and political power to achieve improvements in their domestic environment by importing resources and exporting wastes to less developed countries. If you then look at the country as such within its boundaries, uh, the Netherlands, the little country, for instance, then you think, oh, they are ecologically quite sound. But in fact, the ecological footprint of the Netherlands is much larger. There's no doubt to conclude that the mode of living in the North and increasingly in a part of the South is based on unequal economic and ecological exchange. Not only the wealthy, but also the wage earning classes, blue and white collar, benefit from this inequality. It is extremely difficult if not impossible, to quantify the size of these unequal exchanges, but it is likely that they have increased over time. The observations that I just presented suggest that the years after World War II witnessed the real takeoff of the imperial mode of living, but my reconstruction is, of course, overly impressionistic. For more solid answers, we would need much more detailed knowledge of quite a few aspects. And then, at last but not at least, there's, of course, also the overarching political question how to overcome the imperial mode of living. We do not only need global social and global economic, but also global ecological equality. The total amount of raw materials available worldwide is limited. In the words of Argiri Emanuel, the famous economist from the 1960s, the peoples, he said, of the rich countries can consume all those articles to which they are so attached only because other peoples consume very few of, or even none of them. The question then is, how is equalization possible? If it cannot be achieved downwards by lowering the living standards of the developed countries, nor upwards for technical and ecological reasons, does the solution lie in a global change in the very pattern of living and consumption and the very concept of wealthy? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcel. Oh, what's it? Jeremy, can you put me on again? Okay, thank you, Marcel, for uh, for your presentation. I would like to remind everybody that uh, you can give comments um, on the Q and A. There is one, and don't use the chat. There are officially seven, I see, but nobody will read them anyway. So. Um, that will be a chatty business. Uh, Q&A is, um, is the way to communicate with us as from now. Um, well, we have a comment from Nora Rattler. Is she online yet? Then please, um, can she come into picture, Nora? Yeah. Welcome, Nora. Um, where are you now? Because you're traveling a lot, as I understand. I'm not uh, traveling anymore. I'm just at home yeah, near, near Barcelona. Excellent. Well, Barcelona. 
Yeah. I hope the weather in Barcelona is as good as it is now in Amsterdam, which is completely unique because it was a rainy August. Um, well, you have the floor for uh, commenting on Marcel for um, roughly 15 minutes, and then um, we have a discussion. Okay, I want to share my screen, so I'm trying to do that now. Uh, let's see if it works. Yep. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So um, the title is more like a motto, so I'm not going into detail about that. And I want to say that I was given the task to comment on this fantastic paper, but I'm not a historian, so I'm not really able to comment on individual elements in the paper. I just learned enough, uh, a lot about it, reading it. And um, so what I will do is I try to talk about um, perspectives that inspired me um, in the paper, inspired me to add on some perspectives of how one could think about creating a kind of history of the North-South relations in an additional way um, compared to what Marcel has shown us. So my first point is complicating the North-South relation. Um, normally we talk or often we talk about the global North and the global South and the global North exploiting the global South on equal uh, relations of um, trade and uh, production and so on. And I think that is perfectly reasonable. I do that a lot in my papers as well. But I think maybe it's not the whole story. Maybe we could get some ideas from the chaos theory and their idea of fractals, which means self-similarity of relationships on different levels. And what I mean with this is that if we look at the relationships between the global north and the global south more specifically, maybe we could introduce some concept like the, uh, the concept of accomplices, because the global south is not just a homogeneous global south. There are power relations there as well. There's capital, there are political power relations and so on. And these uh, powerful people in the global South are of course accomplices of the elites and the powerful structures and the relations of power in the global North. So without that relationship between different powerful systems and um, actors, social actors, I think uh, the exploitation that uh, Marcel was talking about could not take place. So if we then look further, we can see that in the global south, we have also power relations between those um, capital, political landowners and so on, and the global south workers, and they themselves are also divided between um, those who are, have relatively safe working conditions and mostly those are the workers who are working in transnational corporations. And we have uh, the workers who are in precarious and formal um, conditions and also subsistence workers, indigenous populations. And um, there was a sentence in the paper of Marcel where he said, ever greater numbers of workers worldwide maintain direct economic contacts with one another and he also added and said, but they don't know about it. And I think that is one of the main problems that we have. Uh, if we look at these relationships, what is missing in order to change the relations of power between the global North and the South and within the global North and the global South is a relationship and a communication between those different workers. And I would say that not even the different categories of workers within the global north, those who have relatively safe working conditions, mostly white men, and those in precarious conditions, mostly female and migrant workers, even those relationships do not exist in any meaningful way. 
So what I want to say with this is when we uh, create or when we um, study a history of the global north and global south relations, we have to include the different power relations that reproduce those kinds of exploitative relations. Second, globalization is not homogenization. And here I pick again a sentence that you have in your paper, Marcel, very unfairly, just picking out a sentence, where you say homogenization is clear in part from the continuously increasing share of employees in the world population. Well, there is an increasing share of employees, but actually that doesn't uh, create homogenization. And I would just give some examples of a research project that we did of the Volvo Corporation, the Swedish Volvo Corporation, not the Chinese one that is producing the cars, but the Swedish one that is producing buses and trucks and machines for ships and air, um, and uh, airplanes and so on and so forth. So we did a research project where we looked at Volvo workers in Sweden, in Mexico, in South Africa, and in India. And here is what they say, although they are working not in the same transnational corporation, their uh, situation is very different from each other. So I'm just reading a quote from a worker in uh, South Africa. But I mean, why should we be called international if we don't follow the same set as everywhere else? You start to thinking, are we cheap labor? I mean, are they coming to this country to exploit us now? That sort of behavior starts you thinking. What am I to you, a slave? We went through this. You should stop this now. Workers are not going to take this anymore. Um, and I'm quoting this especially because you know, the Volvo Corporation, at least in Sweden, I don't know if in the rest of the countries of the global north, has this fame of being a very fair, very well-paying corporation. And even we, who are kind of critical researchers, one would say, were really um, surprised by the level of over-exploitation that Volvo practices in its companies in other parts of the world. So here's another quote from Mexico. There is another work culture in Mexico. Looking at the Volvo values, the colleagues thought that what they're going to do is to bring the European culture here. But they did not bring it, this European culture that takes care of people. There is a lot of insecurity here. There is work, but it's not well paid. People are disappointed. As part of the values of Volvo, they speak about the respect of the person. But people ask, where is this respect? Why are we not paid? And in relation to this quote, I have to tell you an anecdote, which is kind of anecdotal evidence of power relations between North and South. Um, when we had a, a television interview in Sweden about our research and pointed out that Volvo in the Global South is one of the worst employers, um, we were invited to the Volvo headquarters. And when we were reading all these quotes about the workers in the different countries and what they said about Volvo not bringing the European culture to those workers, the manager for corporate social responsibility burst out by saying, but it's only paper. How can they believe this? You know, it's like a caricature of the manager, but it really happened. So finally, um, India. Um, Umeo, uh, the Umeo plant of Volvo boasts itself of having the most advanced, most safe painting unit for workers and for the environment in the world. However, when you go at the paint shop in India, this is what you hear from workers. But in the paint shop, the paint work, they won't do it here. They will take it outside. It's urgent work, you cannot wait. It's an environmental problem. It's people's health, they will not bother about that. They won't bother. So in an open environment, they're spraying. And also they're not thinking of humans. For people who are working in a paint booth, they have to go every four months for medical checkup. 
but they will only do yearly ones. One interesting thing about this is um, when we left the plants in India, they started to strike, not because we uh, convinced them, but <laughs> because they are a very combative workforce. And actually, as a result of that, the manager, uh, the Volvo manager who was an Indian, was re replaced by a Swedish woman manager. And the workers were very happy about the way in which she handled um, the company and the way in which she took uh, the needs of the Volvo workers seriously. So it's another interesting kind of perspective on North-South relations that we can discuss or not. Finally, um, this is the Volvo plant in Umeå, and you see it's very different from the plants that we can see in other parts of the world. But also, the Volvo workers in Sweden are the victims of neoliberalization, and this is how they feel about it. It is not often that one feels that now I have finished building this and now I'm proud of this, because there were many who felt that felt that way when we worked in teams. You could feel kind of proud then, but now that has disappeared completely. And that has disappeared in Sweden because they went back to the converter belt and they um, destroyed or took apart the teams that were working. So one thing to come back to our theme uh, of the workers communicating that struck us was that even though we visited workers, talked to trade unionists, and to a lot of workers in these different companies, which were part of one corporation. The workers themselves had never talked to each other. The trade unionists had no relationships to each other. Three, integrating the nature labor relationship. And this is my last point. And this is. Um, slide that I have stolen from Jason Moore. And it's just to ask the question, you know, how can we write a history of the North-South relationships, including not only the power relations and the different levels of those power relations within the global North and South, but how can we integrate that with um, the way in which capitalism um, transforms nature, and as Jason Moore says, is also transformed by nature. So this is an attempt, one of his talks, I don't know where he got this um, slide from, if it's his own or from somewhere else, sorry, but uh, that tries to put together societal developments and the developments of nature. And to put the final point, a final point that I want to make about uh, the imperial way of living, the imperial mode of living. Um, when we think about it, or when we read the book, we often think about um, workers in the global north who are um, in a better position as they are uh, because of the exploitation in the global south. And we think about well-off workers, but I think the hitch is that the workers who are most dependent on the in the global north, on the exploitation of workers in the global south, are actually the poorer workers, the workers in precarious situations, because those are the workers who cannot afford to buy a t-shirt that costs 50 euros because it is ecologically sound and because it has been produced under more or less human working conditions. So, there is also a silent relationship um, exploitation between the poorest workers in the global north and the poorest workers in the global south. How to think that, how to analyze it, and how to analyze it in a way that we become capable of not only thinking things, but also trying to think about how to intervene into those structures. Thank you. Yeah, um, there are two, so there's no question of uh, prioritizing them. Um, they are a bit different, so I think we uh, can take them up uh, one after the other. Um, Rodrigo Fernandez uh, says, 
Thank you for your excellent paper. I have a question about the role of capital, in particular financed capital, in the historical development of the division of labor. In the previous age of globalization, Hilferding identified the interrelationship of imperialism, monopolies, and financialization. Now fast forward to the new millennium, after five decades of post-Fordism and finance-led capitalism, Monopolies and rentier capitalism are once again at the forefront of corporate developments. Rentier income runs primarily through intercapital relations, subordinating fractions of capital. Global value chains can be dominated, value extracted without full ownership. Can you elaborate on the role of capital and finance capital in shaping interrelationship we find in the imperial mode of living? What type of longer term historical developments can we identify? And I think you should answer that in less than five minutes. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Shall I? Yeah. I think we have on the Yeah. Um, that is not an easy question, uh, Rodrigo. And um, I think that more work needs to be done on this, but let me say it uh, just as a first orientation. I think that uh, the development of capitalism, global capitalism, has uh, seen uh, we have this, this increasing final role of finance, uh, capital, and so on, period since World War One, uh, and that's the period, of course, when Bill Putin also wrote, wrote his uh, famous book. We see uh, the intermediate period, intermediate period from the 1920s to the 1960s or so, organized capitalism or Fordism or state monopoly capitalism, as communists call it. Uh, and then in the recent period, we see uh, the amazing return of forms of capital that were much more important before World War I. So I see this in three forms. One is uh, the return uh, of merchant capital in the traditional sense. So a merchant, as Marx says, is somebody who uh, buys cheaply and sells dearly and does not do anything with the, with the product itself. Uh, and this is roughly, I would say, what we see in the case of firms like Amazon, Ikea, Aldi, uh, and so on. And also in uh, outsourcing of uh, labor power in the form of uh, Randstad, Adesso, uh, and so on. So that is the, the return of merchant capital, but it has become much more powerful than it has ever been. For instance, Walmart uh, is now the largest employer in the world with 2.2 million employees. Uh, and they are really uh, having now a titanic fight with Amazon about part of the market. And so the second form is outsourcing. Uh, Nora just mentioned the example of car factories. I could give another example from uh, uh, Brazil, where Volkswagen has uh, started a, a company for uh, omnibuses in the 1990s, and uh, they built a huge factory with 4,500 workers work and the Volkswagen installed all the machines. And then they made contracts with what they call a modular consortium of six firms uh, who do all the work. And at the end, uh, the uh, su uh, supervisors of uh, Volkswagen check if the cars are okay and then it's okay. So this is not very different the construction from the putting out system in the 18th century where the uh, the merchant would uh, bring uh, the the wool or so to the to the domestic workers they would then produce things and then he would pick it up again and 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 sell it so um there's a, are complications here because sometimes these are really sham constructions of course and all these uh, um, uh firms in the modular consumption are not really independent because they have only one customer and that is uh, Volkswagen. And so the same, we have self-employed people who have only one or two uh, clients. So the clients in fact are the employers. Uh, and the third form then is finance. And we see also an enormous increase of the role of banks and insurance companies in, in recent times. And this is your specialty of course, so you know much more about this than I do. But on all in all, I think, what we should consider is not just the increasing role of finance capital, but the whole change of power relations within the 
world capitalist class. There is a shift where uh, traditional productive capital, that is industrial capital, mining capital, and so, is becoming less and less powerful. Although it is growing, it is uh, it, the size is increasing still, but the power is relatively decreasing in comparison with the power of all these new forms of merchant capital. I think my five minutes are all, but we have to continue the discussion about this. Right. Are there other people who wants to intervene uh, from the speakers or from the panelists or from the audience? Yeah, use the Q&A, there is a new one. Marcus. Uh, yeah, I can Baltus ask about uh, IMF and World Bank. Are there other, are there other people who uh, wants to discuss points? Herman and then Marcel. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Well, yeah. We maybe we should first take the the second Q and A, and then. Yeah. Okay. Are you done? Which of all Yes, yes, but but I have some. I have to un, unmute myself. My. I want to. Yeah, I got uh, the Q and A. Now the second uh, in the Q and A, and there are also a number of hands raised among the panelists. Uh, I hope you uh, the chairs. Um, uh, anonymous attendee, thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Van der Linde. I do have a question, I'm afraid. If the consumption of the people in the global north increases at the expense of the proliferation of people in the global south, then what is the explanation as to how, despite unequal exchange and the ever widening gap between rich and poor countries, that people in the global south enjoy an increase in wages and consumption compared to 20 to 40 years ago? If I recall correctly, there are only a few countries in Latin America that are actually suffering a decrease of living standards compared to their position in the 1980s. So that's a different track. <clears throat> and I mentioned the, the third remark immediately because it's very short. It's by Wim Baltusen and the role of the IMF and World Bank. So it's probably in the total picture that uh, Marcel was giving uh, about the increasing uh, form of uh, financialization. So maybe the first point is, of course, that um, the, uh, the, fact that the, the fact that workers in the North are better off, and they are better off, uh, much better off than workers in the South, has not only one explanation, not only the unequal exchange, but one factor. But there's another factor, and that's that's and that, and that. so the the unequal exchange is one aspect of the increasing uh, of a large uh, income differentials in the world. But there's another factor, and that is endogenous productivity of capital uh, and, and of labor processes, which is. Uh, a second element in the explanation. So we can never only explain the differences between North and South in terms of this unequal exchange. We need the additional uh, explanation of uh, endogenous uh, aspects. Uh, this is, was a discussion already in 1940s between Fritz Sternberg and uh, Abba Lerner. Um, so, but given that, I think that uh, we can say that in the 19, since the 1970s, we see indeed a, a change in the world, as I called it also the second industrial, uh, the second division of uh, labor. Uh, between 71 and 83, one and a half million workers, mostly women, lost their jobs in the clothing and textile industry in Europe and the United States, while two million women workers found jobs in clothing and textile industry in the third world. So there's a shift of employment from north to south. And naturally, as I already mentioned briefly in my presentation, this had a positive effect on the income level of the workers in the South and a negative effect on the wages of some Northern working class groups. So uh, the question is, to what extent did this increase of 
prosperity, relative increase, uh, increase of is prosperity of certain sections of the working class in the thals uh, reduce the differential between north and south in the work the world working class. And uh, here there is a comp uh, the whole uh, study by two uh, economists, Christian Broda and John Romales, who have shown that uh, the fact that the northern products that are sent to the the southern sorry the southern products are sent to the north sold in the north are becoming cheaper because their wages are lower than the wages in the north has reduced uh, the effect and has diminished the purchase income inequality within countries is increasing and the income inequality between countries is decreasing but this is a fact, by the way, an effect which is mostly caused by the rise of China. Uh, and in China itself, you see, of course, this enormous uh, growth of income differentials as well. And we all know that on a global scale, the poor people in the world are in, have, during the last decades, not really become poorer. This is true, as the, the anonymous uh, participant says. Uh, this just that in the North, Prosperity has grown much faster than that the, the prosperity in the South has grown. So the differential has increased, but the situation in the South has, on average, not become worse than it was before. And about the IMF, and so I uh, give the floor to Rodrigo, who is a financial expert. I have no clue. You can't. Uh, uh, you can't give the floor. I cannot say anything. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry. So we have to wait for the solution for later. Okay, thank you. Well, there are two um, members of the program committee, uh, Marcus Wiesen and Uli Brandt, who both want to say something. I suggest uh, we start with uh, Marcus and then immediately afterwards Uli and then Marcel can uh, follow up. Or Nora or someone. Or, or Nora, yeah, but. She's not waving her hands or anybody who uh, wants to. Okay, uh, Marcus. Yeah, many thanks and many thanks for the very good presentations and the very inspiring presentations. I would have one comment and one question. The comment refers to the presentation by Nora. I uh, would like to stress one point you made at the end of your presentation, that there is a difference, a differentiation between um, within the global north, within the working class in the global north. And you said that um, particular those parts of the working class in the global north that are quite poor rely on the exploitation of the working class in the global south. I think, and you use this expression of silent, exploita silent exploitation. I feel like this is a very good expression because it shows the differentiation. And at the same time, it shows that the exploitation of the working class in the global south by the working class in the global north is a structural issue. It's not something that is done willingly, intentionally, but it is because of a particular form of socialization, a particular form of subaltern status within the capitalist society in the global north that forces workers to participate or to participate in the exploitation of the global south. That would be my comment, and I really like this expression of a silent exploitation. I would secondly have a question to myself. The, the idea of a return of merchant capital is fascinating. I've, I read it in a former paper by you already, and I think it's really a very good idea to understand what is happening in neoliberal globalization. But what I wonder is if we still can uphold this idea in current times. So if we look at what has been happening during the corona pandemic, we can see that the global value chains on which the return of merchant capital essentially depends are very vulnerable. They are very vulnerable and can be interrupted through pandemic or ecological crisis phenomena and so on. So if we now enter in a new epoch, an epoch that is increasingly characterized by crisis, by ecologic crisis, by diseases. Do you think that the return of the merchant capital really is something that will shape the future of capitalism? Or isn't there, are there strong tendencies 
that this return of merchant capital was a particular feature. Followed by Christine Richterle. Hello, you... everybody. Yes, I can't um, switch on my camera, but I hope that you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, many thanks to uh, Marcel Joost Hermann that you set up this in, um, in Amsterdam. And um, I'm very happy that um, we start now. Also to the speakers, a very warm welcome. It's a great pleasure and also an honor to, um, to have you here and that you also give us your time to think together with us. And um, also a very warm welcome to all the participants. Marcel, I don't find your paper just impressionistic. It's really um, very systematic and, uh, and I'm very impressed. What do we know and what do we know not know yet? This is an important question when we want to uh, go further in our research. Just a very brief comment on the structure of your argument of the paper, and then I have also some questions to you, but also um, to, to others. You put the part of, on the green revolution into the face of post-Fordism, but I would say it's more adequate in the part of Fordism, and then there are some continuities but this is only a minor thing. Concerning the question of the North South and the exploitation of workers, we argue, and it was argued also elsewhere, that it's not a zero-sum game. It comes back to the question in the chat. And um, Marcel um, already answered this question. Nora also referred to it. And we would argue also that the rise of productivity and the right of the material and living conditions in the North and the South um, have to do with the exploitation of nature which is uh, um, uh, quite often forgotten. So then I have some particular questions uh, to um, not only to Marcel, but also to us um, for today and for tomorrow. Um, Marcel, you start your paper with the, and, and also your presentation with the relation and inequality, and you um, refer to Hornbrook's unequal ecological exchange. But I have the impression you use it more like a metaphor, and you don't really show because uh, um, Alf Hornbock did also some empirical work on this and uh, delved into it. What could it um, contribute to, uh, to further research when we, when we uh, try to, to implement or to use the framework uh, um, uh, or the concept of empirical models or um, with another um, um, approach, but mainly Fordism, post Fordism, et cetera? Torkil doesn't refer to this. Torkel argues that there is a constant, if I got it right, a constant deepening of the imperial mode of living. And I just want to highlight this because maybe if we want to understand the complexity of the imperial mode of production and living, um, how far brings us the distinction between liberal capitalism, Fordism, and post-Fordism? Or a question to Torkel, why do you just say um, there is neoliberalism and neoliberalism is a deepening but you don't refer to a crisis of Fordism, which usually we do in our, in our surroundings. Um, I leave it here. I have other points, but there's still time to discuss. Thank you. Okay, the next um, contributor is uh, Kusta, who is, uh, yeah, your own, I think. Great. Thank you very much. Um, for... Uh, for the inputs, uh, which were really very inspiring, uh, my permanent concern uh, about the imperial mode of living uh, has been the absence of social reproduction in this uh, modern and this paradigm. Uh, as uh, I stress that production, social reproduction, and uh, mode of living are highly intertwined and social reproduction can't be taken out of this uh, paradigm. Social reproduction is much more than consumption. And uh, tomorrow in my uh, contribution, I will uh, elaborate this further. But I found this mirrored once again in uh, Marcel's um, uh, paper that uh, the development of uh, production interlinked, intertwined, uh, and inseparably um, interacting with social reproduction uh, was neglected. Also, you have taken in some uh, gender perspective. Uh, following uh, on uh, Marco's uh, question uh, regarding the return of merchandise capitalism, I would like 
to ask you, Marcel, isn't it that the new forms of platformization and platform capitalism and Amazonization, isn't this a modernization of uh, merchandise uh, capital? This is uh, one brief question. And another uh, remark, when we talk about uh, unequal exchange uh, between Global North, Global South, and the integration of the working class in the imperial mode of living, uh, I remember that Beverly Silver called this a neo, neo colonial social pact, a social compact, um, uh, where uh, the worker uh, in the north who gets uh, uh, a decline uh, has to, to suffer from a decline in wages, he uh, benefits from the cheap goods produced by workers in the global south who even get lesser wage. How can we, yeah, how can we um, phrase this, this paradigm of unequal exchange and uh, paradox integration of the working class um, in Fordism in, uh, to the imperial mode of living? Okay, uh, Marcel, maybe it's time to respond to these three speakers and then people can still <coughs> contribute in the Q&A uh, and um, panelists can raise hands. Uh, so, Marcel. Yeah. Um, well, all these questions show that there's much work to be done and that I did not do all the work that could be done. Um, but uh, let me try to give a few uh, uh, fragments of a, a response. First, Marcus's question on uh, the vulnerability of value chains. I agree with that. Uh, and by the way, this may also be a great strategic advantage for anti-capitalist forces because uh, uh, chains can also be uh, interrupted uh, in that way consciously. Uh, but the the uh, return of uh, emergent capital uh, is, I think it has to do, I, I don't know if it's only neoliberalism which is behind this, but this would also be something to uh, explore further. I think that there are several aspects here. One is that over the course of a number of centuries, uh, the workers in the North and increasingly also in the South have been uh, trained to be um to not to 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 do the work in a disciplined way and so for for centuries uh for instance uh, uh, in the 18th century it was quite com uh, common to that uh, authors would complain in England and everywhere in Europe about the laziness of the workers and that if they can uh, earn enough in four days they will not work for a fifth day and so on uh, and this whole uh, approach this this discipline problem has been solved largely by capitalism. Now you have lots of workers who are so uh, disciplined that they can do work from home, as we have seen in this uh, crisis, and still do everything that the boss uh, wants them to do. Uh, so that's one thing. They have a, a, there has been a mental change, a psychological change in uh, the, the uh, nature of the working class. A second point is that we see a change in the transaction costs. Uh, as we all know, Ronald Coase uh, in the 1930s wrote about uh, the, the question, why do firms exist? And his explanation was that we need firms because uh, if we had no firms, then we would have to deal with all the separate transactions on which a firm is based 
separately every week or every month. You would have to make labor contracts every uh, few, uh, every week or every month. Again, we would have to uh, make contracts with the, the people who deliver the, the raw materials. We would have to uh, make new agreements every time with the customers and, and so whatever. And uh, so it is much more efficient to then have firms. And by the way, also Coase used this argument to show that inside capitalism in the 1930s and before, already some kind of planning existed. Now, transaction costs have been decreasing significantly due to the internet and uh, all kinds of other uh, ways of communication and so, so, and transport has become much easier. So you see that many of these arguments for uh, the necessity of the firm in the classical form is beginning to disappear, at least in certain segments of uh, the economy. And that has facilitated the development of other forms of, uh, of economic activity, like what uh, uh, Krista mentioned, the, the platformization in the form of, of Amazon and so on. So I think this could be elements for an explanation, but there's much more that we need to study before we can really find a good answer to these uh, questions. Uh, the second point is Uli says, you write a lot about commodities and consumption, but not about labor. I disagree. My paper is to a large extent about labor in uh, not just slavery. It's about the culture system in, in Indonesia. It is about all kinds of uh, 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 shipbuilding and textile industry and so on and so on. So uh, it, is, it is about uh, miners who... Uh, collect coltan and so on. So uh, I think that I did not neglect uh, uh, labor in that uh, sense. Um, and I, in fact, I am a labor historian as you said in the introduction and it is my special uh, obligation I feel to pay attention to uh, labor. Um, let me see. Yeah, Krista says absence of social reproduction. I think that is largely true. I said something about the male breadwinner family as a, a uh, form that was a uh, social form that became possible because partly of unequal exchange, uh, but much more could be said about this. I agree. And then finally, let me see, did I forget something else? Well, the, the difference between uh, Torquil and me is something we should work on in this uh, <laughs> conference. Yes, thank you. So I'll leave it at that, Joost. Okay. Um, yes. yes. Can you unmute him? Oh, wait, I need to unmute him. Yes. In my video on, yes, I do uh, want to mention a problem I see now. Uh, somehow, uh, some questions are uh, marked answered, while I didn't mark them as answered in the Q&A. So please let everybody uh, stay away from doing anything with the question and answers. Uh, because otherwise I get lost uh, in, uh, in the middle of everything. Even if you think uh, it's okay now, no, uh, we still want to read out uh, the questions. Um, the first one, uh, Tom Samidun, if I pronounce it correctly. My question, what are your views on the implications of your research on the global people struggles, especially today? when imperialism, colonialism, and the climate are in an increasing state of crisis and confrontation, what is the way forward for global revolutionary movements, especially in light of the necessary strengthening of the relationship between struggling people in the global North and South, uh, given the time uh, that we still have. Uh, uh, shall I take the second question that's open? Uh, yeah, oh, there are more, them are all open now. Uh, let's see. No. 
Yeah, There's a second question by Rodrigo Fernandez. Um, I have a question about the re-emergence of fascism and how it relates to the long-term development and crisis of uh, the imperial mode of living. The global core periphery dynamics continuously generate a changing landscape of combined and uneven development. This has resulted in a variety of models of capitalism. One of these models revolves around the deepening of neoliberalism into illiberalism or authoritarian capitalism, visible in the rise of strong men, Gerte, Modi, Bolsonaro, Putin, Orban, and Erdogan. Are these manifestations of authoritarian capitalism related to the imperial mode of living in crisis? So can you elaborate on the question of why we see a return of fascism and how it relates to the long-term development and crisis of the imperial mode of living? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, well, the second question, uh, Rodrigo, I think that this is something that we should ask Uli and Marcus to answer. They are the real uh, creators of the theory of pure mode of living. Uh, and the way forward for revolutionary movements, that is a bit, uh, we need six extra conferences, I think, to talk about this uh, uh, a little bit more. Um, I think that at, at the moment I'm... I, I used to be very optimistic in the, the few two to eight decades or so. I was very optimistic about possibilities for uh, in the anti-capitalist struggle. Now I have become a bit more pessimist. And uh, the reason for this is that I think that the, uh, the radical forces in the world have been weakened significantly. Uh, the labor movements, uh, everywhere almost is uh, in crisis. Uh, uh, trade unions, for instance, now have a union, the density of trade unions on a global scale is about 6%. Uh, and that is, uh, has been declining during the last uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, politically, I mean, communist parties are in crisis or have disappeared. Social democracy is in crisis and was of course not a real alternative. Um, we see all kinds of other forms of uh, labor movements, uh, uh, radical movements, also uh, not offering an alternative at the moment. And at the same time, though, while we see this weakening of uh, the, the anti-capitalist forces, we see uh, an enormous growth of the challenges that the movements have to uh, solve. And uh, so there's this gap between means and tasks that uh, I have no solution for at the moment. Uh, but I think one way forward would be to, and I, I'm, well, in the longer run, I think that we will see uh, the possibility of a re-emergence of uh, labor movements and social movements in general. Now, I think we are at the end of a long cycle of about two centuries, uh, uh, two centuries in which uh, we first saw the growth of all kinds of radical movements, anarchism, syndicalism, uh, then uh, uh, radical social democracy in the beginning, communism, and so on. And all these have uh, now reached their end, more or less. So we at the end of this cycle, but we see already the signs of a new cycle. And for that cycle, it is very important to evaluate what happened in the first cycle. Uh, and this makes historical studies also very, very crucial, uh, and to see what we can learn from. And so I think one of the things that is very important is that uh, the revolutionary movements in the future should not uh, integrate so easily into uh, established power structures as they have done in the past. It is uh, much more important to uh, build up strength through mobilization and, and movements and so, uh, than to participate in corporatist uh, deliberations as trade unions or in governments as uh, uh, many reform-oriented parties have done in, in, in the past. But all this, of course, needs to uh, much more uh, reflection and discussion. Okay, I think Marcel announced already five following teams for conferences. Um, we have three people who want to say something first. Uh, Turkey wasn't, he's speaking tomorrow. Then uh, Nora again, and subsequently Marcus. 
who will explain fascism for us. Thank you, please. Am I on? Yes. Um, uh, deepening uh, in your mode of uh, living. Yes, uh, I think so. Um, if we, uh, I think we can see neoliberalism and the outsourcing of industry as some kind of Fordism uh, on the global level that we have moved uh, mass production to the global south and mass consumption to the global north. Uh, and it also kind of merchant capital that you that you buy labor cheap and you sell on the market where, where wages are, are high. So this is one way that, that uh, we have this uh, uh, Fordism on, on, uh, on a global level with the introduction of neoliberalism. And another way that the imperial mode of living uh, has been deepened is by the financialization. Uh, I, I, I see two ways uh, for a lot of people, and of course, mostly the middle class, but also the working class, speculation in, uh, in real property, selling of, of uh, houses and apartments, uh, have played a bigger, bigger role also for income. Uh, if you just see the television programs about what is my apartment worth and what and selling and uh, buying, and sometimes people are earning more money than selling and buying their their house and their uh, apartment than by going to work. And another uh, evening is uh, the role of of the pension and. Uh, the working class and appropriating and middle class get uh, shares and, and stocks. Uh, if we take the example of, of, of Sweden, out of a population of, of 10 million people in uh, Sweden today, uh, 1.3 million Swedes own shares directly purchased on the stock market. 5.5 million Swedes own shares uh, via private pension funds and 7.5 million own shares uh, uh, via their occupational pension savings. So you can see that most Swedes are participating uh, as rentiers in the, in the capitalist system. And this is a way they, they are changed into the imperial mode of uh, living. And I see no contradiction in, in this deepening of imperial mode and uh, and a common crisis of uh, the imperial mode of the I, I think that that capitalism is running out of periphery, and I think also and, uh, there's a crisis in the management of of the system, which the declining hegemony of the U.S. is is the most important uh, example of uh, the, uh, the split in the U.S. between. Uh, um, once you want to continue new liberal globalization and and the and the nationalist and the conservative fraction, this split has beaten the capitalist uh, system very much in the recent years. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I want to make a comment regarding the revolutionary global movements. Um, I think we are here in a in a contradictory situation or a paradox because the development of um, of the climate crisis of the environmental crisis has created a kind of common interest on the one hand and. On the other hand, the opposing interests of workers within the global north and within the global south have become stronger. 
So we have on the one hand, the need for cooperation and working together of the different workforces in the world. And on the other hand, a deepening of the contradictory interests between those workers. And just to give an example, for instance, um, struggles of workers in the global South against extractivism, you know, if they were, the more successful they are, the more jobs are going to be lost by workers, some workers in the global North who, whose work is dependent on having the minerals that uh, are extracted under inhuman conditions in the global South. So how to bring these different kinds of workers together. Also, we have to perhaps, um, not perhaps, but maybe necessarily, um, broaden the concept of workers. And that means take into consideration uh, resistance groups that have different kinds of worldviews and values, like for instance, indigenous peoples, the feminist movements in different parts of the world, also not having one common um, way of fighting together. So there is an extreme need of collaboration, cooperation, because workers are more and more dependent on each other. And at the same time, that is becoming more and more or is more difficult because there is the necessity to include more different kinds of workers, subsistence workers, and so on, all over the world. Right, then following one of our co-organizers, first Marcus Wiesen, followed by Uli Brandt. Marcus, please. Yeah, it's a short remark on the... Um, relationship between the rise of fascism and, and the crisis of the imperial mode of living. I would start with a quotation that from the paper um, by Marcel um, that you also used in your presentation. You quoted Emmanuel, the peoples of the rich countries can consume all those articles to which they are so attached only because other peoples consume very few or even none of them. So that means that the imperial mode of living presupposes exclusiveness. So it can only exist in parts of the world. You know, it depends on the fact that other parts of the world do not use their, let's say, proportional share of the global resources and things. But this situation is changing. There are ever more countries, ever more societies claiming their part on the natural resources, their share of the natural resources and the things. This is what we are experiencing right now. It has to do with the capitalist development of countries like China, and Gailin will talk about this in the next part of our conference, and other countries. And with this capitalist development, the external dependency, the dependency of the developing countries on an external sphere increases, and the competition between the old industrialized countries and the newly industrializing countries regarding the things and the resources of the earth and the labor power of the earth is increasing. So there are rising equal imperial tensions between the newcomers and the old industrial, the early industrialized countries. And I think this is the background for at least some of the right movements whose increase we can observe in the last years. They are successful because they are promise that everybody that everything can remain um, as it is. You know, they promise to defend the exclusiveness of the imperial mode of living against refugees, against newcomers. Look at what Trump has done in the United States, constructing a wall at the border to Mexico initiating a trade war with China. And this is something that is quite typical for these right-wing movements, fighting for the exclusiveness, trying to stabilize the imperial mode of living in a very authoritarian manner. I think this is the background why now in the crisis of the imperial mode of living, we can observe the rise of fascist movements. There are many other aspects that are important here. One could also ask why doesn't don't the workers turn to the left yeah, in such a crisis? Yeah? But I think this has to do with the crisis of the left, in particular of the social democracy. 
This is something that I learned from reading the book by Didier Ribon, um, who, who, who described um, his own history, his own biography, and showed the crisis of the left in France. Um, the fact that the left, the social democratic left, has refrained from representing the working class interest. So there is no form of progressive political articulation of subaltern interests. And this is the context against which we can understand the fact that also people from the working class increasingly turn to the right. All right, thank you. Uh, next is uh, Uli Brandt. I saw a few um, waving hands which, which uh, disappeared, but so please, we have still 15 minutes until the break, um, which means um, depending on how long Marcus and speech and how much time Marcel will need to answer, there is some room for further comments. Please, uh, Marcus. Uh, yes, sorry, Herman, for the for my mess when I was starting answering in the Q and A as a as a speaker. I just wanted to avoid to speak too much, but now I got it, uh, that it's not good. Um, one point, maybe this is already the topic of the next conference on what is radical struggles um, uh, about, and maybe Sabrina also can share her experiences in Brazil. My impression is coming more from the background, of course, in Europe and Latin America, it's not so much about the explicit revolutionary struggles, it's more the concrete, the very concrete radical conflicts. Yeah. And, and what is the horizon, how they interlink, how they engage with, with other struggles, but I'm now in Berlin, and here in Berlin we have this fantastic um, movement um, to socialize um, real estate uh, firms, and there will be in three weeks um, a, a a referendum on this, and this would be a very radical conflict, which opens up at least in one concrete conflict field. Um, um, I would say really um, the potential for radical change. Let's see. But so it's not so much the movements, the strong movements, the strong struggles, the explicit struggles, but maybe the very concrete radical conflicts. This is also a bit the experience in Latin America. But I would like to highlight also another point. Um, I put it into the chat, but I'm sorry that um, that I, I caused this mess. When Christa was talking about the reproduction, and I'm not a historian, this is more a question to the historians. I was thinking that Marcel's model, Marcel's explanation is, and this is very fruitful, very important, the rising standard of living can be measured with rising income. Of course, the data is there. But when it comes to alternatives, this was the final sentence from Marcel, we want an alternative model of well-being, and probably th this is not. This is uh, has to do with an, a certain autonomy of income dependency. So then we talk about the public sector. We could probably talk about um, a, a free health system, a free educational system, a free transport system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we we won't in the future in a let's say eco-socialist society. We we don't want a strong dependency from income. So my question to the historians is. Whether a look at history, of course, at income, but also at, at other forms of well-being in particular circumstances may help us to learn from history where worker struggles were not only in favor of higher incomes, but also in favor of historically other forms of well-being. I hope you maybe also in certain moments to become a, a less, a bit less dependent from income. And this could inform us. Um, today for our struggles and for future struggles. I, I hope that, that you get it. I don't know if this data is there, how can we do it, maybe with case studies, but uh, this is an, an, a question um, when, we, when it comes to it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There was one question which Marcel uh, actually forwarded to uh, Marcus and Uli, namely about fascism and, uh, and the right-wing rise. Maybe do one of you uh, have an answer on that, otherwise, yeah, well, but for me, it was not overly clear yet, but okay, Marcel, then you, you understand their answer, so you can then pick it up in your answering of this. Uh... Okay, uh, well, I think many of the contributions uh, made uh, are just very important additions to uh, to our analysis and, and inspire me for further work. Um, so let me 
so uh, and I thought, thought especially also what Marcus said about uh, these right wing movements, which say that uh, uh, we there's no crisis of the imperial mode of living. You can we can continue as we did in the past and so on. Uh, I think is uh, quite convincing. Um, so let me focus on one thing, and that is Uli's question about the alternative model of well-being. Um, I agree that it is very important to have uh, to develop that kind of historical uh, approach to see what kind of uh, embryonic or not so embryonic attempts to develop such an alternative way of defining well-being uh, 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 has been made in, in the past. Um, and I think that it would be possible certainly to uh, to do something in this field. It is true uh, that uh, many workers in the past did not only uh, work for higher wages. You, we all know the slogan, bread and roses, which also suggests that uh, workers in the past did not just only want bread, but also roses, uh, cultural well-being and, and so on. Um, in general, I think that um, what you see, uh, for instance, also there's a very nice book by John Tutino on the Mexican Revolution, uh, in which he says that there are a number of things that are important for people. One is, uh, uh, not, one is of course, the standard of living uh, in, in the material sense, but it's also security, dignity, uh, autonomy. I think those were the things that he mentioned. So the fact, autonomy that you can decide on your, on your fate, uh, individually and collectively. Uh, dignity, that you get some respect, uh, and that you're not humiliated and so on. And security, that you can plan your life in a, in a, a decent way. That kind of things are, I think, come back all the time in social movements in the past. And the, they can contradict each other. Sometimes uh, you can gain more dignity, but then you lose some income, uh, for instance. Uh, or you can gain dignity, but you lose security if you are a very obedient uh, servant and you don't want to be that any longer, for instance. So th there's a, this, this combination of different aspects uh, as many forms in, in history. And it has never been studied uh, explicitly. And I think this could be a very interesting uh, project also to develop uh, ideas about how this could work out uh, in the future. I'll leave it at that. OK, Thank there was a, a, a clearness. Is uh, Stefan Schwartz wants to discuss things? Or there is, was a, a waving hand, and then it disappeared. So Stefan, you want the floor? No. Uh, well, okay. If then there is nobody uh, further on the list, um, I think we can close this part of uh, this session. It's and we reconvene um, in uh, half an hour or exactly at four thirty Amsterdam time. And please enjoy your break. Thank you.